Well, hi, everybody. My name is Valerie Talmadge. I'm the Executive Director of Preserve Rhode Island, and I'm very excited to moderate this session today. We have an unusual topic, and our panelists bring a really unique perspective to the world of historic preservation. So I hope we're going to have a, a really fun and enjoyable conversation. As a basic tenet of historic preservation is that places will be preserved when they are used. So finding a productive use is the number one problem to address to get a building on a sustainable pathway towards preservation. And there's a kind of codicil to that tenet, which is that ownership by municipalities is far from being a preservation sinecure. It's very hard for the needs of old buildings to compete with other town and city priorities. And it's very easy for local governments to put off, defer, delay, and ignore building needs, particularly when those buildings are vacant or underutilized. And that creates a cycle of deferring maintenance and disinvestment, which is really troublesome for long-term preservation. Today, we're going to talk about two mid-18th century buildings, both on, owned by municipalities, one in Smithfield and the other in Providence. Both suffered from neglect and vacancy, and both conceived of curator programs as a paradigm for stewardship. We're, today, we're using the word curator to mean a special kind of tenant, where uh, tenant's rent is either reduced or paid in kind by curator's sweat equity. The curators <laughs> conduct specified rehabilitation projects or lead public programs and in exchange, they live for free or at a reduced rent in the historic building. In our two examples today, curatorship has sparked a preservation turnaround, uh, which is demonstrated both by physical investments in historic buildings and programs that enliven historic places. And so now these historic buildings are really important contributors to their communities. So we only have 50 minutes today, and we'll have two presentations. I'm going to give both presenters the hook after 15 minutes. So we'll have time for questions at the end. Now you can see, you as the audience can see the panelists, but the panelists cannot see you. So if you wave your hand, we won't know it. So please put your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get all the questions at the end. Um, we also want to get right into the subject matter, so I'm going to be very brief on introductions. I don't mean to slight our presenters, but there, there is speaker bio, biographical information available in the conference materials, and you're going to meet them soon enough. But um, to start us off, I do want to say to Garza, Brad, and Hannah, thank you so much for being curators and for taking care of two of Rhode Island's great historic buildings. Curatorships are pretty new in Rhode Island, and you have been trailblazers, and you probably have the bruises to show it. So we're eager to hear about your experience. So we're gonna, I'm going to start by asking Brad Oza and Hannah Martin to describe Revive the Roots' multi-year adventure as the curators of Mary Mowry House in Smithfield. And uh, just to, to start, this curatorship is a project that Preserve Rhode Island created with the Smithfield Municipal Land Trust. So let me start with a very personal shout out to Revive the Roots for making this curatorship a success, sort of proof of concept that this really does work, and thanks to your hard work. So Brad and Hannah. Thank you, Valerie, and uh, we certainly couldn't have done this without you or Preserve Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name's Hannah. I'm Brad Ferdosa. Um, and we're here to tell you a little bit about our experience curating the Mary Mowry House here in Smithfield, Rhode Island. Uh, so, as you can see, this year marks our 10th year of operation. And if you roll back to 2011, um, you have, you know, a group of young individuals that were faced with a lot of different issues of our time from climate change to land security, economic security, and community resilience, uh, we knew that we had to do something. So we reached out to the land trust um, who managed uh, you know, quite a few acres that was donated originally by Mary Mari. 
um, they decided that they couldn't just lease it to a handful of kids, so uh, we had to incorporate, and thus Revive the Roots was born. You can see here our, our mission at the bottom uh, to create ecologically regenerative dynamic social spaces through the education and practice of permaculture. And just a, a quick explanation, permaculture is the idea that human societies should not live separate from the nature that surrounds them. And, you know, through careful planning and being mindful of our surroundings, you know, we can live in harmony with nature in a way that doesn't only preserve it, but helps it thrive. So um, the original uh, lease that we got from the land trust was for uh, a farm property, but on an adjacent property that we weren't yet leasing was the Maori uh, house. And um, this is a picture of half of the house. This is the half that was built in 1750. And um, later this was expanded uh, to in 1850. The original construction was by John Appleby, a local sawmill owner. And the house is situated right at the top of the Winoskatucket watershed. Um, so this really kind of connects us to the whole of Rhode Island uh, and um, really uh, sort of situates us uh, in the house um, as part of um, greater Rhode Island's waterways. So five generations of Maoris lived in the house, the last being Mary Maori, who left the house to the town of Smithfield in 2008. Um, and in 2009, the house was appraised for its teardown value. So um, as the group of young permaculturalists and farmers started uh, working on the land, they created community gardens, planted a lot of fruit trees, but they were really struggling with the lack of, re um, of resources, being able to have consistent water access, a base of operations for this new nonprofit, um, and struggling with finding affordable residents that allowed them to do the kind of community work that they were really passionate in and that we were we are passionate in. Um, so uh, that brought us to starting conversations with Preserve Rhode Island and the Land Trust to make a plan for a 10-year curatorship program. Um, the initial work for this curatorship program included uh, doing exterior window renovation, um, interior renovate restoration, uh, repainting the outside, um, and then uh, rebuilding the 19th century porch. Um, this work plan has gone through some adjustments over the years, but in total, it was a little under 200,000 in the form of sweat equity and material costs that would have been uh, spent over the course of 10, the 10 year initial program. Uh, so none of us had planned on being preservationists, and we knew once we were awarded the RFP that we had a lot of hard work ahead of us. Um, here you see a picture of the house before any work was done, and Preserve Rhode Island helped us to go through a program to learn how to repair and reglaze old windows. We went through lead abatement training, and uh, we quickly learned how dirty and exhausting the job can be, um, but also rewarding when you start to see the final results. Um, some things that, you know, we hadn't really anticipated is how cold an old house can be. Uh, with no insulation and cement plaster walls, we realized we had to adjust the work plan pretty early on to include things uh, like adding storm windows and a wood stove so that we could lower our heating costs throughout the winter. Um, another challenge that we faced is just the changeover in uh, the municipal government every few years. Um, you know, constantly having to reintroduce people and explain what we're doing and why it's important, not only to the preservation of the property, but to the nonprofit and the community that it serves. Um, and here, you know, at the bottom, I have a house with character. Uh, you really start to learn when you live in an old house that it's got quirks and it's got needs and it has to be paid attention to or else um, you may find yourself changing your plans to pay attention to it. Uh, so here you can see some pictures uh, once we started the progress of rehabilitating the exterior of the house, um, you know, replacing rotten trim boards, fixing window sills, 
painting, uh, caulking, making sure that it had a, a proper envelope to keep the water out and to stop the process of rot. Um, you know, we have a, a picture here of a clearly enthusiastic uh, curator head to toe in protective gear. And um, one way that we were able to get through this early on is uh, by listening to motivational speakers while we worked. Uh, a lot of Les Brown and some Zig Ziglar and a few others uh, just to keep us going. You know, we had this vision, this idea, and we knew that the rehabilitation of the house was part of that. And so we stuck with our plan. And the last project which we completed was the reconstruction of the porch. So um, I have here a list of people that we worked with, but we had a lot of guidance uh, from professionals to do invasive investigations, to find old profiles of handrails lost in layers of paint, to use old photographs to pull profiles, to get custom wood turners to recreate the posts that were originally on the porch, you know. And not only in the end did this end up saving us quite a bit of money, but we ended up with really quality products that were much more true to the original products used on the porch. Um, and then I'm going to show you, let Hannah talk about these two pictures. Yeah, so um, as you can see, this picture on the left, this was taken probably around sometime in the 1960s. Uh, this was dropped off by um, Carol Thurber. Um, her and her husband were uh, caretakers for the property um, in the later stages of Mary's life. So this is really all we had to go on when planning the reconstruction of the porch. Um, on the right, you see the um, what we were working with. And um, I think these two pictures next to each other really illustrate how um, a, a thing like the face of the house, you know, the, the appearance of the face of the house really changes the perception of the community. So this house sits on um, a hill that overlooks the whole of Maori Commons. And being able to uh, have a face that really shows, you know, a more historic present presentation to the rest of the property has really changed people's idea of what this house is and the value of the house as well. This is what the house looks like today. Um, and these are the four curators that are currently caring for the house and the property. Um, on the left, we have Tyler Desmaris. He was one of the founding members, one of those young people we were talking about in the first few slides that worked to get that initial farm lease um, to work on the ideas of permaculture. Um, and then we have Bradford next to him, myself, <laughs> um, and, uh, and Annie, who has 10 years of farm experience and her practices are really about learning from the land and working with community to um, close uh, gaps in food security and really bring um, local produce to everyone in our community. And we really couldn't do this and we are really still inspired by Mary Maori. Uh, she donated over 100 acres to the town of Smithfield. Uh, some of this is really valued um, public trails like the Wolf Hill Preserve and um, the Maori Conservation Area and the Mar and Maori Commons here. Uh, she had a passion for genealogy and historic preservation. She was part of Smithfield's Historic Preservation Society as well as a number of other historic preservation societies in Rhode Island. She was one of the pioneering women to get their degrees from um, Rhode Island College. I think she was in that first batch of women to pursue college degrees and was really a forethinking um, woman of her time. And uh, I, I feel really honored that we were able to preserve her house in a way that I think she would really find quite delightful. Um, and we're still working with Rhode Island College. Um, so this is a project that I just completed with um, the biology department at Rhode Island College. Um, Dan Hewins and Stephanie Sullivan helped me um, put together this sign. This overlooks the um, 
the water reservoir, which is at the top of the Winoskatucket watershed. It gives history of, um, you know, what was here before, um, you know, the people who were here before um, colonialism. Um, it gives uh, uh, some information about our community gardens. And, you know, the purpose of the work we're doing, and, you know, it's just one sign, but this one sign is really connecting the people who are walking their dogs, the students who are taking hikes here after they get out of their last class, and connecting people to the land and then the land to the history of the place. And that brings us to the future. Uh, this really cool picture here, this is uh, the three-story barn that used to be on the property. It was knocked down in the hurricane of 1938. And the reason we put that here is because you know, part of our vision, vision for the future is to make this site more accessible and be able to run educational workshops. And um, we're hoping, planning to rebuild this barn as a site for doing that kind of programming um, and keeping it a place for the public. So the big challenge that we're faced with is uh, navigating Revive the Roots ownership of the Mary Mari house. Um, which includes the footprint of this old barn. And we need help. We need people with passion, uh, fundraisers, historians, documentarians, you know, any really passionate volunteers that love the land or the history or just the fact that we're trying to, you know, recreate the vision of this place to be a community site that's inclusive to the whole community that it serves and keep it, you know, keep it from becoming a private property and let it continue its history and let that history evolve along with it. And uh, so I think we're all set. We'll go off to our next presenter. We have one more slide. Oh, wait. Oh, I <laughs> lied. <laughs> um, yeah, so we are um, really excited to be having open houses or open house dates uh, starting in May. It's going to be the last Sunday of the month. Um, registration is required, and you can do that through our website, revivetheroots.org. And I encourage anyone who wants to learn more to visit revivetheroots.org and Revive the Roots on all social media. Um, and donations can also be made at, um, at the website through our PayPal. And, um, and drop us a, a line, uh, send us an email. We're happy to talk uh, to anyone who wants to learn more about this project and um, get involved. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks so much, Brad and Hannah. That was just wonderful. And um, I, uh, you didn't go into very many of the bruises that you have through this curatorship so that we can save that for the Q&A, but um, what an amazing transformation of this place. You guys have just done a great job. Um, so our next up is Matthew Garza who is the Parkiston residence at the Isaac Hopkins house. And Garza is bringing their unique set of skills um, and experience to enliven, and maybe we should say really heal, the Isaac Hopkins house, which is owned by the city of Providence through its parks department. So Garza, you're next up. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the Rhode Island Historic Preservation and Heritage Commission for holding space for this conversation today. Thank you, Valerie, for moderating. And thank you, Maori House, for sharing about your work with me today and with us today. Um, as Valerie said, my name is Matt Garza, and I am one of two Parkiston residents with the Providence Parks Department and the Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism. Today, I'll be sharing about our first year living and working in the East of Hopkins House and Park. And I'll also be sharing more about our current historical intervention project in development, the historical fantasy of Issa Hopkins. Um, first, I'd like to invite everyone to take three breaths with me. I'll invite you to close your eyes and place your hands over your heart so you can feel your heart beating. Maybe give your shoulders a few rolls first. <sighs> first, I'll invite everyone in this um, virtual space to take a breath of gratitude for whatever comes to mind. Breathing in and out. A breath for all of the ancestors we bring to this moment. May we learn from their stories told and untold. Breathing in 
and out. A breath for the intentions and well being of everyone with us in this virtual space and those from the future who are viewing this archive. Breathing in and out. Thank you. Before I share more about our first year in the Issa Hopkins House and Park, I would like to. Oh, this is how it's going to go. I see. I would like to honor my grandparents, Agosta Vera Garcia, artist and healer, Jose Garcia, educator and activist, Remigio Garza, earth worker, healer, and community organizer, and Ramona Figueroa Garza, artist, educator, and healer. I want to honor my indigenous and Tejano ancestors of the U.S. Mexican border who imagined my existence and fought against colonization again and again and again and again. I also want to um, acknowledge that our work at the House of Glitter is in lineage and collaboration with the BIPOC legacies of Seidu Kulubali, Michelle Bak Kulubali, and Seku Kamara of the Yeridon Center in Jumanzana, Mali, Darlene Munro and Fumi of the Black Earth Collective and Lab, April Brown and Kai Cameron of the Langston Hughes Community Poetry Reading, Andrali Horn of Open Farms, Joe Ayuso of Movement Education Outdoors, Martin Rivera Baldera and Yantande, as well as all of the queer femme BIPOC ancestors who have fought for change so that we can be having this conversation. None of us would be in this work together without their courage, wisdom, and magic. To share a little bit more about my practice, um, my full name is Matthew Rolando Garza, son of Rolando and Nelda Garza of Alice, Texas, and San Diego, Texas. By training, I'm a dancer and choreographer, multidisciplinary performance artist, historian, and educator who works at the intersection of historical intervention, cultural preservation, liberation pedagogy, and decolonization strategy. Today, I'm here representing my family, my fiance, Anthony A.M. Andrade of Cape Verde and West Africa, and my godbrother, whose government name is Trent, but prefers to go by his artist name, Trash, of West Africa and the local Narragansett people. For just over a year, the three of us have been living in the former home of Issa Hopkins, commander of the slave ship Sally. As many of you know, the Parks Department is our landlord. I am also here representing the House of Glitter Dance Company and Performance Lab, part of the Glitter Goddess Collective, a community of artists, performers, educators, therapists, counselors, and healers dedicated to exploring the intersections of learning, play, liberation, and social, emotional, spiritual growth. The House of Glitter Dance Company is choreographing for the collective human body. We work in legacy with the Afro-Latin diaspora of dance to shift the energetic center of the universe towards liberation. Finally, I am here representing the brilliant and ferocious artists at Trinity Academy for the Performing Arts, a radical community of learning that disrupts the school to prison pipeline by working in community centered creative practice. During our first year in residency here in the park, we have been living and breathing and creating around our studies of the legacy of Issa Hopkins, whose home was built 256 years ago, to engage in the beginnings of what we hope to be at least 256 years of patriotic restoration, transformation, and liberation. You can read more about our first year in the park at houseofglitter.org. For those who are not yet familiar with Issa Hopkins, um, Issa Hopkins is celebrated as the first admiral of the U.S. Navy during the American Revolution, despite the fact that he was tried and dismissed from the Navy in 1777. To quote local historian Tracy Picard, his case is considered a pioneer of American whistleblowing because his own men reported his problem behavior. He is a grand example of the many, mostly men throughout history and today, who acted impetuously to the harm of many, blame anyone but themselves, and fail to lead with anything approaching humility or wisdom. You see, before the American Revolution, Isak was also hired by the Brown Brothers of Brown University to command the slave ship Sally. We at the House of Glitter are proud to report that in our first year of residency, we did not colonize, murder, torture, or enslave a single U.S. American citizen. During our first year in residence, we learned so much from the history preserved um, 
around the legacy of Issa Hopkins, and we are proud to have peacefully negotiated all disagreements and tensions to avoid any warfare, battles, or physical violence. We are proud to be surpassing Issa Hopkins' um, numerous accomplishments with fewer casualties and crime in every category. Marking a bittersweet ending to the chapter of Issa Hopkins' story, our work is a disruption of the historical archives make it known in time and space that there are stories missing from the picture we've painted of Issa Hopkins, and to remember that our daily lives are history in the making, to imagine what could be. We spent our entire first year studying the archives and history books, learning from our elders, connecting with earth and ancestral wisdom, getting to know our neighbors and holding space for dialogue, community building and creative healing practice. We learned that we could even read the letters he wrote to the Brown brothers of Brown University from the first voyage of the slave ship Sally in the digital archives at Brown. Quote Tracy Picard once again, Hopkins purchased and enslaved 196 Africans and 109 of these enslaved people died along the way. They suffered from illness and despair and at least one woman took her own life. We also know that a group of enslaved captives staged a rebellion and some of them were killed by Hopkins and his crew. It is recorded that nearly all of the enslaved people who survived were in a very ill state upon arrival. Deep in our research, however, we found no stories about the indigenous people who previously lived with this earth space we now call the Issa Hopkins Homestead and Park. And we found even fewer stories about the enslaved people who were so intimately integral to his legacy. We realized that the historical research we had been engaging in did not represent all of the people in the story and that the glorification of Issa Hopkins legacy instead represents a fantasy. So we decided that we would turn to our own imaginations to create a fantasy of our own, a piece of art that tells our story as well as how our ancestor stories intersect with the legacy of Issa Hopkins. After all, we might be the most legendary historical event to take place in the homestead since Issa Hopkins died in the home. As part of our community engaged rehearsal process in 2020, we released three original albums, music and music projects on our independent record label. We co-produced a virtual dance concert in cooperation with the 2020 senior dance company at Tapa and raised $2,500 to bring youth of color on ancestral hikes. We coordinated mutual aid of over $12,000 in direct COVID-19 relief and created youth, elder and community stipends for community service and other community healing programming. We also distributed teas, herbs, farm produce and groceries to our neighborhood and our community. Because um, COVID did not allow us to manifest, oops, I actually jumped a slide. Because COVID did not allow us to manifest our vision for indoor community programming and performances and gallery shows, we launched the Liberation Garden, an outdoor community earth space for intergenerational art making, teaching and learning and environmental justice organizing, cooperatively run and maintained by us, our neighborhood and local youth and environmental justice organizations. We designed and facilitated our original virtual and physically distant outdoor curriculum and programming in decolonization, yoga, mindfulness, and Afro-Latinx diasporic dance culture and history for local public schools, after school programming, and other local justice and advocacy organizations. We also taught 200, over 200 free and donation-based community yoga, meditation, and dance classes, both virtually and physically distant, over, for over 12,000 participants and continued our seventh year of free weekly community yoga and meditation offerings virtually. We co-hosted Pronk's first physically distant and first 100% BIPOC run festival, um, the 13th annual Pronk Fest, featuring 100% BIPOC art act, and activism to pour over $30,000 into our community of local BIPOC elders, youth, artists, and community organizations. As part of the Prompt 2020 Festival, we hosted an outdoor youth protest, open mic, and BIPOC Poetry Slam Heritage Picnic. We choreographed a climate justice march from the former home of Issa Hopkins through the Chad Brown Projects to the State House and to local activist murals downtown. And we hosted a private indigenous ritual and blessing for the house and earth space. We also hosted a community altar, a public community altar and performance and restoration ritual to invite BIPOC community elders to reimagine our collective relationship with the space, to heal the space into a community space, and to bless our collective process of reclamation. For us, our research is synonymous with our creative process, which is synonymous with our work in the community. 
Our project, The Historical Fantasy of Isaac Hopkins, will be the culmination of our two years of research in the Isaac Hopkins homestead and park. In addition to sharing the stories, cultures, and creative magic of our community, this project shares a fantasy that we have created to imagine the missing stories from the legacy of Isaac Hopkins, to imagine what life would be like today if colonization or slavery never happened, and to rehearse for a world that centers healing, care, and community. In fact, even though we spent so much time reading and hearing Hopkins' name, the story we couldn't stop thinking about was the story of the woman who hung herself on the first voyage of the slave ship Sally. Inspired by our research with one of our collaborators, local artist Jarrett Key, whose work is pictured here, we decided to ask ourselves, what if we imagine just one single Black person as a fully realized human with a story, a family, emotions, someone who could scream, cry, and shout? You see, all we know about her from our research thus far is that she was identified to be a woman, that she was Black, and that she was recorded to have hung herself on the first voyage of the slave ship Sally. Once we started to begin this process of empathizing with one single person, we realized that we knew so much more than that. We also know where Issa Hopkins sailed to, so we can believe that she was from West Africa. We can believe that she was probably going about her business, maybe going to school, praying, farming, selling handmade goods in the market, singing, dancing, or taking care of her family, as our studies of West African people during that time were known to do. We can believe that she was brought to a castle on the Cape Coast, kidnapped by indentured servants from neighboring villages. We can believe that she was separated from her family forever, tortured, beaten, and starved in a single white stone room where we can still see the red blood stains lining the space today. We can believe that most of the people in that room died, surrounded by urine, fecal matter, vomit, afterbirth, blood, and menstruation. We also know that she survived that room. We know that she was put on the slave ship Sally. We know that she is remembered as an individual in the archives. And we know this because she is listed on the inventory list next to bottles of rum and rope. Unlike those on Sally who died from the known torture of these voyages, those suppressed with violence, this woman hung herself alone or perhaps with help. By nature of this choice, Isaac Hopkins and his men had to carry her body as an individual. They had to deliberately throw her individual human body into the Atlantic Ocean. Did they look her in the eyes, too? Even still, we found ourselves searching for missing pieces of the story. The archives were not enough to do justice to this woman. So, we have created the historical, we have imagined and created the historical fantasy of Issa Hopkins a multimedia dance concert, album, film, curriculum, coloring book, graphic novel, and community demonstration. The historical fantasy of Issa Hopkins begins with the story of this woman, her life and the legacy that she birthed on the first voyage of the slave ship Sally. We believe we are carrying on this legacy to refuse complicity, to refuse oppression, to refuse silence. We plan to premiere a workshop of this project in cooperation with PVD Fest 2021. And this summer, we will also be bringing our piece on a workshop tour to Dominican Republic and Mali in West Africa. We hope for this performance process to evolve into a community proposal for a contemporary liberation museum and truth and reconciliation center here at the former home of Issa Hopkins. We also hope that this performance will set the stage for the Providence Commemorative Works Commission, the Board of Providence Parks Commission, and the Mayor's Truth and Reconciliation Committee as they consider the future of this house, the Issa Hopkins statue, the name of Issa Hopkins Middle School, as well as our role, the role that queer feminist BIPOC community should play in the writing of our community's evolving history. We are raising $75,000 in 2021 to make the workshop premiere of the historical fantasy sparkle this fall. You can support our historical intervention by going to www.houseofglitter, that is H-A-U-S, um, to donate, sign up for our rehearsal meal train, lend your expertise, and get on our email list to learn more about how you can show up for this work. If you have reflections, ideas, resources, or connections to send our way, you can send us an email at thehouseofglitter at gmail.com. We need all the help we can get to transform this space into a space that is healing, liberation, and empowering for everyone in our community. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Garza. What an amazing curatorship, just in, a, in one year. And um, wow, <laughs> uh, 
Um, we now have time for a panel discussion and some questions. So audience members, please get your questions going in the Q&A. Um, and I think we have some to start off with. Um, one thing that strikes me is that um, you are both uh, living in properties that are owned by municipalities who are not um, who are not really experienced in um, um, the unusual arrangements that have been made. And I wonder um, if you would peel back the curtain a bit about what it's like to be a curator tenant in a building owned by a municipality. Um, uh, where are the where's the rub? What should we watch out for in other um, potential curatorships? Anyone want to take that question on? <laughs> uh, I'll say a couple of things. Wait, wait. First, do we say what stays in this session? Stays in the session. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I think one of the big things that you know, it doesn't really get talked about is the the emotional weight and the the emotional work and burden that gets carried along with this all. You know, you have a vision for a space that a whole community is putting a lot of love into and not, you know, off the bat having a long term security in it. Um, you know, knowing that the whole project could be uprooted, you know, sort of without your input. Um, and you continue doing it because, you know, it's important whether we're doing the work we're doing here or, you know, somewhere else. And I think at times I tell myself, like, it's good that we're doing it here and that it's hard because if it was easy, then the progress we were making wouldn't be so impactful. Um, do you have, um, you want to add something, Garza? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting emotional just thinking about just how heavy the last year has been for me and for my family, um, like sleeping in this house and cleaning in this house and, uh, you know, having family experiences in this house, working in this house, you know, teaching from this, doing everything from this house in the last year has just been so overwhelming and intense. There's so much energy in this space and in this park. and. Um, you know, as far as peeling back the curtain, this space is not a residential space. And I think this is something that we've learned with the city um, in the last year. And, and it and is a big part of why we're really proposing that this is not a space for a family to be, but for a community to be. Um, and so that's been a really helpful perspective to have and really difficult perspective to come through in our collaboration and our relationship with the city. Um, we've learned so much about just how to seek the agency of working with the, with the municipality and, and even with the state and on a national scale, like how do we work with the systems that exist and how do we also work to build new systems um, that can make space for the work that we're calling for. So. It's been really we've we've confronted our edges. I've been describing it feels like we were like swimming in a river and someone like plucked us and dropped us in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And we were like, oh, wow, we have to learn how to swim all over again. <laughs> um, and it's exhausting. So um, I'm proud to be here in this house. I'm so proud of of what we've done in the last year. And I'm and I'm proud of our community and grateful to our community for showing up. I, I've learned how, how much community has our back and how much community is is ready for this work of transformation. Um, and, and I'm grateful for all of the lessons that we've learned in negotiating with the city. And, and for me, something that I didn't necessarily plan for was like, yes, we're doing work to build curriculum and community experiences and arts and to live as um, intentionally as we can um, as intentionally as we would have liked Issa Hopkins to live. And the other layer of, of work that is happening is, is in those negotiations with the city to hold our boundaries strong and steadfast, to say, I'm not comfortable with this conversation. I'm not comfortable with how this conversation is being had. And that's hard to bring up because it feels like housing security is like hung over our head. Like if we misstep, we'll be kicked out. Or if we misstep, you know, we'll, we'll ruin these relationships. But ultimately, like, 
I'm not going to let this door close behind us. And I need the the narrative of 2021 to be written that that change was happening and the House of Glitter was part of that change. So for me, I'm just advocating that the house like moves forward and the energy moves forward. And for as long as we can bear it and stomach it and endure it, we're going to keep negotiating and pushing the city to to imagine something different. Do you feel appreciated by your your so-called landlords? I guess uh, not. Don't want to take that <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, never mind that part. <laughs> um, it, it goes back and forth. I think there's a huge a huge willingness for the town to see this as um, a public asset. But I think there are um, forces that aren't necessarily by the elected officials that um, put them under a lot of pressure. Um, so you can have a narrative that you're trying to present about, yeah, having spaces for the public is good for the town as a whole that get undermined by um, philosophies of development and um, and sort of one track thinking. You know, our work here is is kind of like both with the Parks Department and the Department of Art, Art, Culture and Tourism. The Department of Art, Culture and Tourism, you know, Micah and Gina and Lizzie have held us so compassionately and gently and have been so committed to supporting us to thrive and to be well in this experience. Um, and Wendy has, showed up with so much support from every step of the process has been so responsive to um my voice my anger our anger our frustrations and um so ultimately the answer to your question is yes and like you know picking back uh up off of the maori house's response that you know the system needs work this like for the the system is not designed for this type of work and so a lot of the times where we come up to friction we're we're really confronting a system not a person not not our landlord but how the system yeah. is set up and frankly like the system of white of uh, the system of historic preservation is set up to preserve and uphold narratives of whiteness and and so much of how this industry has thrived is around its ability to uphold, uplift, and preserve white narratives, the narratives that have had the resources to be preserved. And so already we're confronting a systemic issue here that is maybe upheld by individuals, but is a is a systems issue that needs to be addressed. It's not personal, it's a system. And so again, that just calls for how much, how many systems we're really coming up against and ultimately like the work of white allyship in 2021 and beyond is to to take on and embrace the discomfort of being a part of dismantling those systems which might make which might mean that you have less comfort or you have less um but to think of more about what systems do we need so that everybody is taken care of for with an abundance which might mean that like we need to put our jobs on the line or we need to be speaking up for um for what is right and what will take care of everyone you know, in uh, the preservation world, we often talk about the power of place and how place um, is really important to uh, be a memory of events in our past, um, the, the full spectrum of the pens events in our, in our past. And I wonder if living in these two mid 18th century houses, you know, built within five years of each other, um, you have experienced, I mean, you've experienced uh, powerful um, uh, senses of the importance of these places in grounding our history and truth. Do, do, do you share that um, as, as dwellers in these places? Do you share that idea that historic places have a lot of power that carry, that carry, um, beyond just the, the structures that we're seeing? Well, I uh, I know this is kind of stepping back a little bit, uh, but something Garza said uh, about the last thing made me think, um, you know, having Wendy and for us having you, Valerie, and, you know, having a few champions who are well-connected and well-educated about the whole system, 
really helps to make you not feel like you're alone, uh, especially at the times when you do feel very alone and, you know, you have someone to reach out who will listen and um, find a way that you can help each other. And uh, I mean, thank you, Valerie. And I know I work with Wendy. Wendy's amazing. Uh, so you're real lucky to be working with her, Garza. Um, yeah. But if you want to take out, I think, you know, our house doesn't, or the Mary Mari house that we're living in doesn't have such a, a significantly dark past. I think this maybe is something that applies more to the Isaac Hopkins house. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to remind everyone that we have five minutes left in the session. Okay. And nice. um, go ahead and after this is over, get into the attendees and you can make connections if you'd like to speak more with Garza or Hannah and Bradford. Um, you can make connections in there and um, help them with their causes more. And I guess we have two polls open. Is that right? Or at least one poll is still open. Um, maybe. And um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, one from Caitlin. How do you find that your commitment to your work was impacted by living in these in these spaces? Were you inspired, defeated, a little bit of both? A lot of both. Um, a <laughs> lot of both. Um, this is like a process I feel like broken like so often and learning how to feel like that's a process of breaking open and, and dismantling work is is hard emotional spiritual intellectual physical labor and um i could not i cannot describe like i cannot describe uh the art is the best way i know how to share this like you know the the just the scale of how much it is felt to be in a space like for our work to suddenly matter more because of its proximity to whiteness was an experience in itself for people to care about our work in a different way simply because of our proximity to whiteness was fascinating to to experience and then you know i will also say that i've never lived more intentionally in my life like i've never on a day-to-day -day basis feeling the like commitment to embodying what everything that I value in this space and in this in this time that I'm in this house like I'm so committed to disrupting like the way of living that Isaac Hopkins um left us and and that's that's like a beautiful um pressure to feel and it's full of of a lot of toxic confrontation and you know disruption work is is messy and 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 you know my internalized my experiences as a queer person of color like come up of course in my family with my partner in the house of glitter so you know it's um it's been a beautiful and an, an experience of of breaking open over and over again that um it's it's uh i hope to i hope to move out of this house and always be connected to it always work in it um and and i know like the that there's going to be a new spaciousness in in that moment where we're like we're gonna create a new space that is does not have this cloud hanging over it as well <laughs> to lay our heads to lay our heads <laughs> that's great um and andrew is uh doesn't have a question but i do want to read it that he just wants to say keep up the good work and continue forward with your work so um i think you have oh, a lot of fans in the historic preservation world grateful for what you're doing to protect these places for exposing the stories of our past in ways that uh, really make the and and then making the the historic buildings really part of the community so that um, uh, we have a, a it's not an earth arts arts culture it's a true culture about um, the the real experience of being Rhode Islanders from the very beginning of human occupation in this area. Do you guys want to add any last minutes? I think we have one more minute left. Yeah, I, I just want to say, yeah, our, um, my background is in art and it's just, you can make art about something. It's like that first step into like opening up a no more nuanced understanding of something. And I'm really, it's, it's inspiring to see, um, how your art has has changed this. Yeah, and 
uh, just, uh, you know, everything is so structured and we chose a hard path that no one's really choosing. And at times it makes you feel like we're, you know, we're pioneering a new front of emotional intelligence and cultural support and, and trying to, you know, go back to that idea that, you know, all private property stems from an original theft and the more property we can secure for public space, like the more we can heal those original thefts. Well, thank well you so much. Grateful. Go. Oh, sorry. I was just, I'm, I'm grateful to be here and grateful for the connections and to be connected to this work and grateful in advance for um, the support that our attendees and our collaborations will, will birth. Thank you. What a great panel. You guys are great. Thanks so much for all your work. Okay. Thanks. I hope, hope everyone enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thanks.